Hey everybody, uh, we are having communion. At Corinth, the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so, knowing that you're at home, we thought you might participate in the Lord's Supper there. So, if you have got some saltine crackers or some piece of bread and you've got some juice, then I say, as long as you feel like you are right with the Lord and you're following after Him, then please participate in the Lord's Supper with us. Uh, the reason that I say you feel like you're right with the Lord is because the passage of Scripture that I'm about to read, it actually is followed by a warning saying that you should come to this table in a worthy manner. Well, what does that mean? That means that we come to the Lord grateful for what He's done for us, that we come humbly, understanding that Christ died for us and we didn't deserve that. Um, he paid a great penalty for us so that we could be close to the Lord. It's, it's significant that we come understanding what it is that Jesus has done for us and that we've committed to make Him the Lord and Savior of our lives. So, with that in mind, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, on the night of Jesus' death, he took bread. And I have got some matzah crackers right here. This is uh, unleavened bread. The only difference is it's more like a saltine than anything else, except it's not salted. And uh, I want to use this to show you this is what Jesus did. He took the bread and he thanked God for it. And then he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What he was telling us is that he was going to have his body physically broken on the cross. And he would do that to benefit us. And what he's commanding his followers here on this night is he's telling them, I want you to remember this. Be aware of what it is that I am doing for you and make sure that it is passed on to others. So tonight, today, Let's just pray a minute, thanking God for what He's done for us. God, we're grateful that You loved us enough to die on a cross to pay for our sin. We pray, Father, that You would help us just to understand better what that means, that You would let our lives be transformed because of the work that You have done for us. Thank You, God, for providing for us and for taking care of us. Thank You that while we were still sinners, you died for us to pay the, the price for our sin. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. This is the body of Christ, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of him. First Corinthians 11 goes on and it says, this is verse 25 and following. It says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So, uh, when Jews are celebrating the Passover, there are four different cups that are a part of the meal. And they all have to do with redemption. Jesus was pouring this cup. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What he's telling us is there is a, a new agreement between heaven and earth. It is a, a refreshing, a refilling of the original covenant where Jesus fulfills all of the Old Testament law. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, particularly when we're talking about Passover, and that's why Jesus' followers were gathered together was to celebrate the Passover. It was a time when Jesus, or excuse me, when, when the Father delivered all of the Israelites who are in real bondage, they were real slaves, and uh, he set them free and instituted this sacrificial system where uh, a lamb's blood would be shed and then the doorposts of a house would be painted with that blood, and as a result, the death angel would pass over that particular home. 
And so Jesus becomes the Passover lamb for us. Um, that is really the new agreement between heaven and earth, that as we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, His blood keeps us from dying. Jesus said that in Him we would have life. Um, he told us that even though a person dies, they would live um, because of Him and because of the sacrifice that He made for us. This cup is the new covenant in Christ's blood. Do this in remembrance of Him. And the passage tells us, as long as we do that, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And that is an awful lot to celebrate right there. I hope that you had opportunity to celebrate this at home. I read an article recently by a guy named Kerry Newhoff, and um, I thought it was pretty interesting. He writes about how um, in church circles, we tend to equate the idea of being a Pharisee with being a villain, being somebody who's evil. And, um, and we use it that way in our culture, in our society now, as a matter of fact. I looked up the word pharisaical, and it basically, the definition is to be self-righteous or hypocritical. But, but really... The Pharisees in the Bible, they were well-meaning. They were well-intentioned people who, who read the Scripture and understood what it had to say, and, and they had started out really seeking after God. As a matter of fact, there were some that, that are good Pharisees in Scripture. We see Joseph of Arimathea who helps take care of Jesus' burial. We see um, Nicodemus who comes to Jesus and I think really and eventually ends up developing a relationship with the Lord. And then similarly, we see this guy who changes everything. He is a reformed Pharisee who comes to Christ, and he is known as the Apostle Paul. Yet, Jesus condemns the Pharisees because they, they were prideful. They lacked compassion. They were hypocritical. And um, uh, according to Newhouse, um, the irony is the people who purported to love God the most are the ones who turned their backs on Him and had Him crucified. Listen to this. Newhoff cites this survey done by the Barna Group. He says, 51% of North American Christians polled all possess attitudes and actions that were more like the Pharisees than they are like Christ. In other words, the attitudes of most Christians were described as self-righteous and hypocritical. According to the study, only 14% of Christians surveyed reflected attitudes and actions that better resembled the attitudes and actions of Christ. And Newhoff says what surprised him was that his own ideas and behaviors and thoughts tend to sometimes reflect uh, the Pharisees instead of reflecting Christ. Well, I want you to consider just for a minute all of the decisions that you have made in the last week. Maybe right now you're thinking, I didn't have too many decisions I could make because of the governor's order to stay at home and provide, you know, mitigate this coronavirus, that sort of thing. I just wasn't able to go out and do the, all the things that I normally do. I didn't have a whole lot of choices. Well, I want to suggest to you that we have one extremely important choice that we're making regularly, and that is, am I today, am I in this minute, going to honor and glorify God in the way that I live my life? Uh, that is probably the most important choice that you are ever going to make. Today I want to tell you about a passage of Scripture. It's in John chapter 12. And so if you are watching this and you've got a Bible, you could push pause, go get the Bible, open it up, and you could read this along with me. Uh, I would encourage you, read beyond just the passage that I'm going to read. Read the whole context. Read the whole chapter. Read the whole book. You know, understand what is going on. But uh, we have been, over the last several weeks, talking about seven sayings from the cross things that Jesus said while he was being crucified. But as we enter Holy Week, starting really today, I'd like for us to go back in time a little bit, before the crucifixion. The things that we're going to look at in this particular passage of Scripture happen 
six days prior to the Passover meal when Jesus was arrested. So this is about a week before his crucifixion. Um, Jesus has been slowly making his way to Jerusalem for the Passover and to die on a cross, and he's been telling his followers that, that he was going to die, and three days later he would be raised to life again, but they don't understand what's going on. So let's take a look at our passage. This is John chapter 12, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 12. It says, The next day, the great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! <clears throat> Blessed is the King of Israel! Um, let's just pause there a minute and talk about some of these things that, that are being said because they don't make a lot of sense in our society, in our day and time. So, so they took these palm branches, and I've got a palm branch. Hang on, I'm going to grab one real quick. And they're waving these palm branches, and then they're laying them down in the road in front of Jesus so that he doesn't have to walk just on the road. Um, we don't see this in this particular passage, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we see is that people took their coats off and also laid their coats in the road. Well, why are they doing that? What does that mean? It's a lot like a, a flower girl who comes down at a wedding and she puts these flower petals on the ground. It is a way to signal the person who's coming behind me is somebody who's extremely important. This is uh, the most important person at the gathering. This is someone whose feet shouldn't touch the ground. And so we're putting down rose petals, or really in this biblical case, not rose petals, but palm branches and our coats. Um, they say, Hosanna, which means save us. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that is a quote from Psalm 118. And it is basically a way of saying the person who, who we are shouting to is somebody who is royal. They are a savior. They are a military might. They say, blessed is the king of Israel. I mean, it doesn't get any more overt than that. The people are, are communicating in every way that Jesus is their king. So our passage goes on here, verse 14. <clears throat> it says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. So in this particular instance, Jesus is the one who is doing all of the action. He is taking the initiative to sit on this colt. Um, if we were in England and everybody said, oh, you know, here's the king, God save the queen, God save the king, and you had this person walk in and they allowed people to put a crown on their head and they held a scepter and maybe they even got on a white horse and rode through town, you would understand what they were communicating, that that person's royal. Well, in the same way, everything that's being communicated here is that Jesus is the King. That's very significant in this passage of Scripture. I want to ask you, what have you decided? We talked a little before about the decision that we make. In your own decision-making, have you decided that Jesus is King? Max Lucado talks a little bit about Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is not in our story, but he is a Pharisee. And um, Nicodemus is one who, he comes to Jesus and he says, uh, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you were doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus gets to know Jesus. He's seeing him do all of these things. Nicodemus is familiar with the scripture. He's studied it. He's understanding it. And he's seeing how Jesus is fulfilling things. And, and moved, he goes to this carpenter, this person who is a, not in a high position. He's not somebody who's lofty or elevated. And yet he speaks truth. And he does these miraculous things. And Nicodemus believes, man, God's hand has got to be on Jesus. There's got to be something very special about him for him to do the things that he's doing. And so 
Nicodemus takes a great risk. He goes to Jesus under the cover of night. Why does he do that then? Because most of the Pharisees don't believe in Jesus. They don't think that he is who he says he is, that he's going to do the things that he's going to do. Well, here's Nicodemus. He's got clout. He's got power. He's got position. Let me just ask you, if it were you, would you risk all of those things on a curiosity? Would you take a big gamble on something that could be career-ending just because you wondered about it? See, I think Nicodemus has a pretty good idea that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised one. And he feels so strongly about it that he's willing to take a big risk with his career by going to Jesus and talking to him in the night and finding out more about what it is that he teaches. Well, here at Corinth, you know, a lot of you have taken that gamble. You've taken that, that opportunity to find out who Jesus is, and it has changed your life. You've acknowledged him as king, and because of it, uh, maybe you've left a lucrative job behind in order to pursue this Christ and do the things that you know he wants you to do. Um, some of us have left home behind, and we've moved to faraway lands because we believe he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords, and the whole world needs to hear about Jesus. Um, some of you have gone door to door, knocking on your neighbor's doors and saying to them, did you know that God has come to us and he's died for us so that we can have a relationship with him? Over and over again, I can give you examples of time where you have given your time and your energy, your money and your attention that you have given overtly to God because you are convinced that he is the king. Um, maybe today that doesn't describe you. I'd just like to ask you, have you, in your decision-making, come to that place where you can say, man, I know for sure Jesus is the King. I see all these other lives that have been transformed by Him, and I want that for myself. You can pray today, quietly. You don't even have to say it out loud. God knows your heart. And you can invite Christ into your life by making him king and ruler over who you are? Are you willing to gamble everything on Jesus? And maybe a better question is, are you prepared to gamble on everything on the fact that Jesus is not who he says he is? Because these things affect your eternity. Folks, I'm just going to be real upfront with you. I know that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's the ruler of my life. I hope that's the case for you too. Our passage of Scripture goes on here in verse 16. It says, <clears throat> At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Verse 17 now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has come after him. And basically, you got this enormous crowd here. And in the crowd, you got three different groups of people. You've got people who saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, and they're certain Jesus has done amazing things. He is the king. And then you've got people in the crowd who have just heard about the miracles, and I would imagine they're uncertain. Maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's king. Maybe he isn't. But we're hopeful that he would be. And then you've got people in the crowd, like these Pharisees, who say, he was openly critical of us. How can that be God? Surely God wouldn't tell me I'm, something I'm doing is wrong. And so they have rejected Jesus, and they've decided we're going to not only reject him, we're going to stand in opposition to him. Jesus has called them on the carpet because of their hypocrisy, because of the unfair demands that they are putting on people and that they're not following themselves. 
he, he's called them on the carpet because they've reduced their whole religious experience to a bunch of do's and don'ts. If you love God, then you do these things. If you don't love God, then you don't do those things. Rather than seeing a relationship with God as a place where we seek after Him, we ask God, what do you want for me? How do you want me to live? Reveal things to me, Lord, and help me to follow after you. Those are the things that Jesus is most critical of here. So, so in terms of your decision making, I want to ask you, are you choosing not to be pharisaical? The Pharisees have decided he can't be king. That, um, that study that I was telling you about, this guy, Kerry Newhoff, um, he basically goes through and he enumerates 10 things that he believes are, are pharisaical. But I want to just share with you some of them because I think they're pretty applicable to us today. Uh, listen to this. One of the things he says Pharisees say is, you shouldn't hang around with people like that. And, you know, when our kids are little, okay, maybe that's a good point. Maybe we're careful about how we choose friends for our children, that sort of thing. But as an adult, that kind of theology stinks. And here's why. Jesus said just the opposite, that this world needs salt and light in it. That is, it needs preserving agents. It needs light and darkness. And the salt has to get out of the box sometime. Jesus hung around with people that the Pharisees could not understand why he would hang around with them. Now, they weren't his number one closest friends, but he hung around with tax collectors, hookers, and notorious sinners. I mean, when was the last time you led a hooker to the Lord? That might be a little disturbing, but hopefully it's a little convicting, too. Lost people need Christ, and God has called us to a life that serves Him. How about this pharisaical saying? Sure, I have a few issues, but that's between me and God. If you keep all of your issues private and people don't ever know that you struggle or that you have a hard time, you're really falling into the same thing that the Pharisees fell into. Jesus criticized them as being a whitewashed tomb, something that was beautiful on the outside but had a dead body on the inside. So how's your relationship with the Lord? What do other people know about how you struggle or don't struggle? Are you just trying to put out a pretty front, but really you're dying on the inside? Don't be like that. How do we cure that? How do we change it? Well, uh, transparency. How about vulnerability? How about honesty? As we are upfront and open with people that we're a mess, but that God has done a work to save us, even me, I think people will see that and they'll start to get on board with what it is that God is doing. Another thing that he mentioned was, uh, these are pharisaical sayings, is, of course I'm a Christian. And here, Newhoff quotes Tim Keller. He says, Keller points out again and again in his preaching that religious people say things like, of course I'm a Christian, but that underneath that there is this pernicious idea that they have somehow earned the favor of God by their obedience and faithfulness. And he says, true Christians, in contrast, are amazed that God would save them. You know, there's this sense that like, I just can't believe that God would do that for me. Isn't that great? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? I am, I'm overwhelmed. Here's another pharisaical saying, more people need to stand up for Christian values. Uh, let me just, I, I feel like I need to give a little bit of explanation to this. Here in the West, we were once a Christian nation, and we are not any longer. Christian values are going by the wayside. And I think sometimes we get confused in terms of saying people need to hold Christian values when most of the people in our country are not Christians. Uh, I don't see that as the way that Jesus handled it. Never once did he or Paul or any of the New Testament writers say to everybody, you need to uphold better standards. I think as a matter of fact, as our country moves away from Christ, we have more in common with the New Testament because they were in a very secular age, a very secular society, and they had to lay down their lives to see other people come to know the Lord. So, so maybe our frame of reference needs to be a little different. 
Instead of trying to say, everybody needs to hold on to my values, what we need to say is, everybody needs Jesus. Let's introduce them to him. And then, as he becomes their king, as they make that decision to follow after him, they'll understand better um, what kind of moral values they should have. The reason I'm giving you these different points is just to serve as an example There needs to be a part of us that we decide, I'm not going to be pharisaical. I'm going to be open and honest about who I am and what God is doing in my life. I'm going to seek after the Lord. And I hope that describes you today. The last thing I want to mention to you is, in terms of deciding, have you decided to decide? You know? Like, if we say, God, I want to follow you, but not right now. We're creating a problem. Or if we say, I'm going to kind of follow you, but not really, there's an issue there. Years ago, I read this uh, article. It was about uh, train wrecks. And it basically said there's three different kinds of train wrecks. There is the kind of train wreck where uh, a train stays on the track and it bumps something. And that causes a problem. You know, people in the train, they fall. They might have a broken arm or concussion or bumps and bruises. But it's not really that big a deal. So that's the first kind. The second kind is much more severe. It's one where the train is moving so fast that it derails completely. The whole train comes off the tracks. In that kind of accident, people are going to be severely hurt. It's going to be more than just broken bones. People might die. As a matter of fact, everyone on the train might die. But that's not the most severe kind of train wreck. The most severe kind is where the train partially derails. That means it was going fast enough that the train kind of got off the tracks, but not completely. And the problem is, people are definitely going to be hurt inside that train, but they may not get word to other trains. And if you have a pile up of trains in a place, that is somewhere that a lot of people are going to get injured. Why am I telling you about trains? It's because... If you have decided to be a, I'm a Christian, but not really a Christian kind of person, then you're a partially derailed train. You're causing great problems. Maybe you've given God your Sunday morning, but you said, I'm not going to let you be Lord of my marriage. Or maybe you've said to God, I'm going to give you my speech, but I'm not going to surrender my alcohol consumption to you. Or maybe, maybe you're saying to God, yeah, I'll give you an hour on Sunday, but I'm not going to let you be Lord over my business practices. The problem is other people are going to see the way that you're living and think that's what Christianity is all about. Listen to this. This is Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It says, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Don't be a partially derailed train waiting to destroy other people spiritually. Instead, make a decision. Make a choice. I'm either going to acknowledge that Jesus is the King and I'm going to surrender my life to Him completely and passionately, or decide this is not true, this is not real, and I'm walking away 100%. But don't stay halfway in between the two, causing other people problems. You know, as we are moving into the Easter season, this is the time when we recognize Jesus very publicly, very openly did everything He could do to prove to every person that He was exactly who He said He was, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who came to save humanity. And people still don't believe. Uh, They look at Jesus and they say, well, he was a good teacher. Uh, Oh, yeah, even though he did the most miraculous of things, which is he brought himself back from the dead. I mean, that doesn't happen. Even though he did that, there are people who still don't believe, and I think largely they don't believe because they don't want somebody else meddling with the way they live their lives. There is an almighty God who loves you. But with his love and care, he also brings some parameters on our lives. 
because he wants to help us, because he wants us to live this life the best way it can possibly be lived. I hope this Easter you make him the king over your heart and over your life. Decide to decide to be his. Let's pray together. God, we are so grateful that you love us and that you give us these biblical principles so we know better how to live our lives. Help us to be wise, Lord. I pray every person who hears this will choose to follow after you, to be yours and understand the peace and the power and the grace that you bring to life. I pray that people would have hope, that they would have joy, and that you would make their lives complete. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've made a decision today to follow Christ and you want some help, would you contact us? It's www.corinthbaptist.us. That's our website, and you can email us from there. Let us walk with you through these first steps of following after Him. And I hope that you have a happy Palm Sunday today.